Next week, public screenings of a controversial documentary will begin in Sligo and Leitrim. They're being organised locally as a response to the granting by the government of onshore exploration licences to two companies, the Loch Allen Natural Gas Company and an Australian-owned company called Tambora. Locally, very little is known about the company's plans, but as Philip Boucher Hayes has been finding out, there's an increasing degree of anxiety about the possible environmental consequences. Philip joins us now from Drumshambo. Where I am right now, Mary, uh, on the shores of Loch Allen would be known to you and me as Drumshambo. But if we were geologists, this would be known as the Northwest Carboniferous Basin or the Loch Allen Basin. And the reason for that is under the ground that I'm standing on right now, some people reckon there is one and a half billion barrels of natural gas. In today's prices, that would equate to about $94 billion. That's the kind of money that, well, would allow us to flick two fingers at the IMF and say, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chopra, but no thank you. The problem is we might not ever be able to extract all of that. And there might also be an environmental cost. Very recently, as you say, two companies were granted licence to come and explore the possibility of extracting all of that gas that we know is under there. But so far, even though those licences have been granted for a couple of months now, the local community have been told very, very little. And the spectre of corrub gas type discontent within the community hangs large over this enterprise because there is unrest. There is worry locally here about the economic dividend passing out of this area and also that environmental impact. Earlier on, I bumped into Sean Wynne who's chairman of the uh, Loch Allen Conservation Association. I asked him about those fears, and I asked him as well, how much exactly had the companies told them? Did they know about what was going to be happening here? Very little. Are you surprised that these companies haven't come and talked to the local communities yet? Well, it's maybe that they haven't started, but like over the years we have wind farms, we had open cast mining and, you know, there's no free lunches. If you're carrying out exploration and you're drilling for gas or drilling for oil, obviously that there's an impact on the environment and we're maybe a little, you know, suspect that the whole thing hasn't been come out into public domain and what the prece- they hope to do and where the potential drill holes are. Because it's several weeks now, in fact probably over two months since these licences were granted and yet here you are in an information or a knowledge vacuum. Should these companies come out and tell people exactly what it is that they're going to do? Well, it, it all depends and I suppose that they're finding their feet on the ground and seeing who they... I mean, our campaign over the years is to keep Black Allen in you know, as pollution-free as possible. And any potential exploration or potential extraction of gas or other materials, you know, has an impact, just like what we had on the side of the Corrie Mountains, where there was a major landslide uh, over two years ago, where uh, Quelsha and uh, uh, subsidiary of the ESB got a, a planning permission to install a um, wind turbine farm. So there's no free lunches. It has an impact and anybody that goes to the river there just outside of Drunkernan will see the devastating impact of ill-planned and ill-thought-out development. There is no such thing as a free lunch, but the uh, dividend from extracting the gas underneath our feet now could buy quite a few lunches uh, for quite a few generations to come. Does that, do you think, create an imperative to get this gas out of the ground, no matter what the cost? Well, that's where, you know, the people of this area had to, over the years with uh, the uh, mining in Arigna and that, that they have more exposure to the b- a balancing between what you have in relation to economic development and the environment, uh, environmental impact. So the this locality has to in the coming weeks and months make a decision before it's too late that we could end up as a result of this development with an economic wasteland and profitable coffers in another jurisdiction that if it's going to be spent in the with this, the crisis that's in this economy then 
that's fair enough that everybody knows that there's a percentage of the money going to be retained but if it's going to be foreign contract workers and outside interest coming in to exploit our local national a resource in our republic then you know it needs to be questioned do you think that this has the potential to be as divisive as carb gas pipeline? Well, if it's if it's not handled correctly and that the people are there's misinformation or disinformation and the or no information uh, so far or, or no information, the people that propose this uh, development need to come and explain what exactly the potential impact of this development. Sean Wynn of the Loch Allen Conservation Association. Now, I have made contact successfully with the chief executive officer of one of those two companies that have been granted licences, the Loch Allen Natural Gas Company. They say, unfortunately, as much as they would like to talk, they are not in a position to go public at the moment. We would hope that we would be able to talk to them. Because, well, one of the interesting things that's happening here now is, obviously, we know in this area there was drilling back in the 80s. But the gas that they found at that time was determined to be too expensive to extract because we didn't have the technology to do it. But with rising gas prices now and new technology, we can. And that technology is called fracking or hydraulic fracturing. But it is not without its controversy. Listen carefully now. This is the science bit. In preparation for the fracturing process, The casing will be perforated in the horizontal portion of the well using tubing conveyed perforating guns containing explosive charges. This is audio lifted from a demonstration of fracking made by one of America's leading shale gas companies. Crudely put, what happens is that a hole is drilled down into the shale rock. It is then lined with concrete and then small holes are perforated with explosive charges through the concrete into the shale rock. With the initial perforating complete, the tubing and perforating guns are pulled to the surface and the workover rig is replaced by a hydraulic fracturing crew consisting of a number of high-pressure pumps and blending equipment. They pump a mixture of water, chemicals and sand down the hole. Under pressure, the water and the sand push into the natural fractures in the rock, further cracking it open. These fractures are contained within the shale formation, well below the ground. When the water and chemical mixture is pumped out, the sand stays behind, propping the fractures apart. Gas can then be extracted as it seeps into the drill hole. At the conclusion of the fracturing operations, production can start. So far, so straightforward. What has become controversial in the United States, though, is what happens to all of those hundreds of thousands of gallons of water and chemicals. The fluids are then recycled or disposed of according to state and federal regulations. But that hasn't been the experience of everybody in Pennsylvania, where almost 3,000 wells have been fracked in the last five years. Like, we would take a glass of water out of the tap, and it would have, like, an oil base on the top. You could smell it. It would smell like diesel fuel or some kind of oil thing. You know, I I used to go to my sink and get a glass of water. I can't do that anymore. I, I have to put lotion on my hands three times a day from using the watery. Even wash my dishes or wash my clothes or anything. The problem is the chemicals that have been added to the fracking solution of water and sand. There have been complaints that methane gas has migrated to water sources so people can literally set their tap water on fire. Is that amazing? Uh, some people drink their water, I burn mine. Uh, they tested it and there was no, they said, well, there's no methane here. I said, okay, I took the bottle, shook it up. Told the guy and lit it and goes, woof. I said, well, that water burns. The shale gas industry strenuously denies any link between its drilling and problems with drinking water. Our experts have come out and have checked over our casing, our cementing, the drilling practice itself. They have determined at this point that there is no uh, cabot operations that is occurring, that is allowing for the uh, discharge of methane into the water. But because fracking is a process that is still in its infancy, the industry is learning as it goes. Last year, it was forced to change the type of concrete it lined its wells with because it was allowing gas and liquid to leak out. Up until then, the industry had sworn blue that there was no problem with the concrete. We had a little bit of heaven. The only thing you heard at nighttime here was your heartbeat. 
Definitively linking what goes on underground with fracking is hard. Not so for what the industry does above ground. Now it's, it's just totally devastated. A pond on Truman Burnett's land in rural Pennsylvania was destroyed when a small amount of frack water leaked into it. And the water dumped out down off their pad, down across my land, into my pond, through the pond and into the wetland here alongside me. And what it did, it killed the pond, uh, killed the fish, killed everything in the, in the pond. No frogs, no turtles, nothing. Our, our drinking water in our house has high concentrations of lead. Uh, they've recommended it, or they've told us not to drink it and don't bathe in it. From our heaven, now it's turned into our hell. The problem with frack water is as much one of perception as reality. The shale gas industry has been secretive up until now about what chemicals it puts in it. There are over 500 of them, though, and environmental scientists are very worried about their effects. These chemicals at low concentrations can be dangerous. Believe me, it is the part per trillion and part per billion concentrations of chemicals that can undermine your health and especially if they happen to get into the drinking water of a woman who's pregnant or in the drinking water of our children. The industry says that the chemicals compose a half of 1% of fracking fluid and they would all be found in household objects. You know, methanol, hydrochloric acid, ethylene uh, glycol, it's about half of 1% of the fracking fluid is a chemical or is it really a cocktail of chemicals and but but think of but do the math on that that means that that's 5,000 gallons per well is chemicals or toxic chemicals suspicion has filled an information vacuum largely because George Bush's Energy Act in 2005 exempted the shale gas industry from having to comply with the Safer Drinking Water Act This has led to lax state regulation and even laxer self-regulation. Some of the sites are well regulated, yeah, where DEP and OSHA and stuff like that, where they're right on them and stuff, yeah, they're well regulated. But the rest of the 95% of them, where they're not going to go out to the site and look at them, no. (laughs) No, they're not well regulated. Some of them are real bad. The shale gas industry may actually, in spite of what its critics say, be fracking to the highest possible standards. But accidents happen, and the cumulative impact for Pennsylvania has been enormous. The estimate of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Preservation is one serious environmental concern for every 150 wells drilled to date. You do the math. If we're talking hundreds of thousands of wells, we're doing hundreds or thousands of spills. That's called cumulative cumulative impact. So it goes to the heart of your question, why are you not seeing all these things yet? because the cumulative impact is accumulating. Come back in 10 years. If fracking is to go ahead in Ireland, agencies like the EPA may hold the industry to a higher standard of regulation than in the United States. But the public relations battle will be a hard one to win. The method of gas drilling they use is called hydraulic fracturing, or fracking. Films like this one. Gasland have already presented the downside of the industry as far outweighing any economic upside. Despite documented health risks and environmental impact, hydraulic fracturing is spreading across the globe. Whoa, Jesus Christ. It's not supposed to do that. That's a small clip from the movie Gaslands, which is going to be screened off the back of a mobile cinema in this part of the country on a couple of occasions in the course of the next.